chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, around it, that's Luke chapter 4, verses 38 and 39, Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, verses 38 and 39, two, two simple verses there, tucked away into the gospel of St. Luke. Chapter 4, verses 38 and 39. When you found it, you will discover these words. Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. But Simon's wife, mother, was sick with a high fever. And they made request of him concerning her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever. And it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. I want to talk about Jesus' handle. Jesus handles the heat. Whether you have power or not, in the state of Texas, in the United States of America, and I dare say the whole entire world, we've gotten used to heat. In the midst of global warming, where some say never even exist, we need Jesus to handle the heat. I remember the days in the backwoods in the country of Mississippi, walking through cotton fields at 105 degrees, you can see what we call little monkeys jumping at the end of the road. 
if you're a city person, you don't know what little monkeys are. There are no physical monkeys jumping in Burger Taylor. But as you look down that road that may be a quarter of a mile to a mile long, in the cotton field, you can see little heat waves doing their break dance, doing their thing while you're looking down that road and saying, I got a long way to go, and then I got to get there and turn around and come back. We chop cotton, and when you, the city folk, when you chop cotton, you don't chop down the cotton. You chop the weeds around the cotton. And as we chop cotton, we could always see little heat waves in 105 degrees, but 105 in the 60s, 70s, 80s was nothing to be compared to 105 today. That's a different kind of heat. The 20th century heat was heat that you could stand. When we went to church on Sunday, they didn't have air condition as we know it. They didn't even have window units. When we went to church on Sunday and it was cold outside, they had what is known as a pot belly stove. And they would put wood in the stove. They would crack the lid just a little bit for some air to get in there because it takes air to create heat. And, and all of a sudden, the place got warmed. And in the midst of them waiting for the place to get warm, they didn't hold up church like we do till somebody get there. In the 21st century, you see, we got to wait till more than two or three gather in his name in order for the service to get heated up because, you know, we know when Aunt Maddie gets here, she's going to start the old 100. And we know when Miss Suzette gets here, she's going to sing with great conviction. In the 20th century, we didn't wait on that. We would walk in the room. It was cold in the room. And, and you could hear the, the men folk patting their feet on the hardwood floor. And it was real hardwood. And they would sing out with old 100, talking about, I, heard, I love the Lord. He heard my cry. And somebody over here would get started with that song. And the people over here, I mean, it got hot in the church. <laughs> people over here were just moaning in, I love the Lord. Uh, he heard my cry. And then we, they would cry out, I'm, and they would sing that song. And it came from the hymnal for masters that were singing. And John, who was guiding the stagecoach, would sit outside and he would listen to them sing. And as he listened to them sing, he would take one particular stanza this Sunday back to the others, and then the next Sunday he would get another and take it back, and they would put it all together and talk about how they loved the Lord. He heard my cry. And then somebody else would say, and he pitied every groan. As long as I live where trouble rise, I will hasten to his throne. Let me tell you, even in the cold weather, in 20 degrees, it was hot in the church. But now we got air conditioning. We have uh, three inch seats that we sit on. And, and we can wrap back and get comfortable. And some even wait till they get to church to go to sleep. I mean, it's so comfortable at, at church for some folk. They can sit in the same seat every Sunday and go flat to sleep every Sunday. It's so comfortable. Sometimes I wish we would just take the chairs out, get rid of the pews in some churches, have everybody stand. And if somebody stood, then they may fall out the window, break their neck like the boy did when Paul was preaching. But we are so comfortable with what God is doing. God has blessed us so much until some people have come to the conclusion, I don't want my children to go through what I've gone through. And therefore, we have a bunch of bratty children, a bunch of children that won't work, children that are healthy. They rather lift weights and exercise than they are to go to work. And then they have, we have raised a group of children who want to take your stuff rather than work for their stuff. 
I, I told you, and I, I told you the other day, a woman heard a, a ring at her house. She saw on camera the guy was breaking into the house. She leaves her, her job and goes, and she confronts him in between the two houses, and, she, and he's going to launch at her. He shot her. She shot him. Then the news reporter always would tie, find the one with the messed up hair. The one with roller steel in their head. The one that's been up all night that looked like a crack addict. The news reporter put the microphone in her, her face and she was reportedly the cousin of the guy that got shot. And she had the nerve, the audacity to ask the news reporter, how else is he going to get his money if he doesn't break in somebody else's house? We have come to a point in our lives where we think that life all, always ought to give us something. We have come to the point in our lives where we've gotten away from Paul's record where he says, if a man won't work, he should not eat. I told you, Matthew Davis, chapter 4, verse 34, says it like this, if a man doesn't work, he ought to starve to death. If a man doesn't work, we ought, to, we ought to watch him dry up and die. It didn't say if a man got laid off. It didn't say if he couldn't find a job. It says if he refuses to work, he ought to die. We, we're raising young men who, who we don't want them to work. And some of these women need to get off. That's my baby. He wasn't a baby 20 years ago. That's my child. He doesn't need to be out there in that hot sun. I've told you, I don't believe that any person who has a 10-year-old or older ought to have a, a yard man because the 10-year-old or older ought to be pushing the yard more and mowing the yard himself. We have left the old path. When we look at the text, we find Jesus. After he leaves church, he goes to Simon Peter's house. Some country folks know what it means to take the preacher. Uh, Sister Henry know what it means to take the preacher. That's when, that's when in the country the preacher would come, and he wasn't nothing but an itinerary preacher anyway. Yeah. He, they, he would come to church on first and third. That was, a, that was almost a full-time preacher there. When they had church first and third, and then across the street, the other church had it second and fourth. And then all of them got together on fifth Sunday, and they had what is known as union school, where they had Sunday school. And then they got together and had a big picnic. And, and what they did is they took the preacher. What that means, Sister Hopper, is they would invite the preacher. They would already have it on their calendar for the whole year. And you're going to take the preacher this first Sunday. I'm going to take the preacher this third Sunday. You're going to take the preacher. What that means is the preacher and his family get invited over to the house. And while they're at the house, we're going to feed them real good. I'm just going to tell you, growing up as a boy, I hated when they took the preacher. Because the joker would sit in the chair, he would wrap back with all his berries showing, and he would eat everything up, and he would get to eat everything before the children could get anything. I grew up despising the preacher. <laughs> because the preacher had privileges that folk that were living in the house could never have. I understand a little better now. I understand a little better now that it's a blessing to be able to take care of the preacher. It's a blessing to be able to take care of the preacher's family. I didn't know why people were so blessed with a little nothing. It's because they treated people right. Well, look at the text. My first point to you is Jesus cares for humanity. Jesus cares for humanity. I said Jesus cares for the Bible says, verse number 38, Luke chapter 4, verse 38 says, Now he arose from the synagogue and entered into Simon Peter's house. But Simon's wife, wife's mother, Simon's wife's mother, Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever. That means his mother-in-law was sick with a high fever, and they made request of who? Of Jesus concerning her. They knew
knew that Jesus was always concerned about humanity. The problem we find today, men, women, boys, and girls are not concerned about humanity. We can see it as late as yesterday. It doesn't matter if you're for a person politically or not, we must be concerned about humanity. It doesn't matter if you're a Republican, Democrat, Independent, or no particular, uh, uh, no particular affiliation at all. Jesus is concerned about all men, all women, and all girls. We got to get concerned about humanity. Because when we're concerned about humanity, we realize that we are human beings. And it's just we're just a shot away from going through the same thing that Mr. Trump is going through. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter where we stand. And I've spoke many times against the policy in the hearts of the man. But I don't want the man killed. I just want him to come so close to death and he still hell in the midst of it. Mm. I don't want him dead. I, I don't want him uh, uh, assassinated. But what I want him to do is turn toward God. Jesus is concerned so much about humanity until he understands that as a human, God is reaching out to us. God is looking for human beings that, that he can save their souls. There's no better candidate on planet Earth as far as I'm concerned than the orange man that need to get to know God. There, there's, no, I, there's no other person that's more con, that I'm more concerned about getting to know God because I'm telling you, when a person gets to know God, our pimps become preachers. When a person gets to know God, dope dealers become security at the church. When a man gets to know God, prostitutes become missionaries. When a man gets to know God, lives are changed and people are delivered. When they get to know Jesus, the Apostle Paul says, when a man gets to know Jesus, he is changed. He is different. All things are passed away. Jesus cares. Jesus is concerned about fallen humanity. Jesus is concerned about human beings. And in case you didn't know, Jesus is concerned about you. He, he knows what you're going through. And he knows where you are. He knows how long you've been going through it. He knows you've been dealing with this rascal for 38 years. He knows that you've been putting up with her for the last 12 years. He, he knows that your friends are your foes. He knows when they're backbiting you. They, he knows when they're stabbing you in the back. He knows when they're gossiping about you. Jesus is concerned about fallen humanity. Jesus is concerned about us. He's so concerned about us that God desires that no man would miss it that no man would not go to heaven. God is concerned about every person getting to know him. And that's why he's given us more time. That, that's why we see the birth pains of his coming back. We see the birth pains of Jesus on his way back. When you see men that will shoot you at point blank range for no apparent reason, let me tell you, they are not concerned about humanity, but Jesus is on his way back. When you see women that will put their own baby in a microwave and, and push go and push start on the microwave, Jesus is on his way back. When you see a grown man take a baby and push him into a bathtub of scalding water, it reminds us that Jesus is on his way back. I stopped by here to tell you on my way to the rapture that Jesus is concerned. Jesus cares for humanity. In the text, we see that he's confirmed, concerned about humanity in the fact the Bible says they confronted Jesus and told him about Peter's mother-in-law, that she was sick with fever. It was a high fever. New King James says it was a high fever. It was a devastating fever. Have you ever had a fever in your life? It caused you to be overheated. It caused you sometimes to have chills. It caused you sometimes to be out of your mind. When, when medical uh, diagnosis says that you have 104, especially uh, 104 for adults are extremely high, you can go into a seizure. 
Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a devastating thing when your body temperature gets above 100.4. You are at the verge of overheating and you can suffer from a heat stroke. It's because fever causes discomfort. Fever causes us to be, be dehydrated. Fever causes us to sweat beyond our normal sweating ability. Fever will mess up you. Fever will kill you. Jesus is so concerned about it until I got my next point here. Jesus cures our sicknesses. Jesus cares for human humanity, human beings, and Jesus cures our sicknesses. When you look at the woman in Mark chapter 5 that had an issue of blood for 12 long years, this woman couldn't go around the church folk because she stinks. Because the, the law said that you should not be in public. But the Bible declares that she had blood flowing from her body. She didn't just have it once a month. She had it flowing from her body 12 long years. She was ceremonially unclean. She wasn't fit to be around other folk. She couldn't worship freely because when she walked in the door, they understood who she was and that the gossip had gotten out that she'd been bleeding for 12 years. But this woman knew that Jesus could drive the faucet. She knew that Jesus can turn the faucet off. She, she knew if she could just touch the hem of his garment, he would make her whole. Man, Lynn. Side to the seashore for 38 years. The Bible says that he was concerned because he couldn't get in the water because the angel came down once a year, stirred up the water, and the first one that stepped into the water, the first one that got into the water was healed, and then the angel was going on down the road. He says to Jesus, I have no man by which to put me into the water so I can't get healed. For 38 years, I've been watching the angels study and stir up the water, but for 38 years, I've been watching other folk get healed. Let me tell you, Jesus cures our sickness. This man declares unto Jesus, I ain't got nobody to put me in the pool. Jesus said, get up, pick up your bed, and walk. This man was instantly cured. Jesus cures our, our sicknesses. Jairus' daughter was sick. Mark chapter 5, Jairus' daughter was sick. She was sick, and di Jairus would tell men, you're going to die, and they had to die. Jairus would tell men, I'm going to let you live, and they continued to live. Jairus was a great commander. He was able to do great things, but his daughter was sick. And let me share something with you. It doesn't matter how much power you have. It doesn't matter how far you can go on your own. It doesn't matter how well you are built. It doesn't matter how strong you are. Sooner or later, something going to happen to you that your doctor can't fix. It doesn't matter how many vitamins you take. Some folks take about 25 vitamins a day. I mean, literally, they, they can stand or sit, and they just count them out. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I'm not talking about medication. I'm just talking about vitamins. And they've come to the conclusion that the vitamins are keeping them. And they've come to the conclusion, if I just take one more vitamin, maybe I should add another one. Maybe I should add two, three more. And what they don't understand is all that doesn't go in your system come out in your stream. If we're going to depend on God, now let me just make sure I put a disclaimer here. You ought to go to the doctor. You ought to listen to the doctor. You ought to be the best patient for the doctor. You ought to go to the doctor and do what the doctor says do. Make sure it's right for you and watch it yourself get better. But when you're in a bad situation, even while you're going to the doctor, you better call on the great physician. His name is Jesus. He makes us well. He cures our sicknesses. And the thing about Jesus' cure, you have no side effects. You see, some people can't take ibuprofen because it messes up other stuff. Yeah. This woman probably could have taken ibuprofen, but she didn't have any. Yeah. She probably could have taken Advil. She, she probably could have taken Tylenol, but it wasn't on the scene. And let me tell you, sometimes God will put us in a position where we have to totally depend 
depend on him and we have to depend on him alone. How many of you have been in a position where, where you have done all that you can do? You have been everywhere you can go. This woman with the issue of blood had gone to doctors and those jokers took her money and made her worse and not better. I tell you, Jesus cured our sicknesses with no side effects. You know, they give you a, a, a pill for your blood pressure, then your kidney goes back. They give you a pill for diabetes, then your lungs go back. They give you a pill for a headache, then you have internal bleeding. Jesus cures all of our sicknesses without any side effects. <laughs> Look at this woman. She is sick. She has a fever. This woman is bad off. She is sick unto death. She's past the stage of being hot as you were this week. Some folks some folk can't stand no heat now. And then some of y'all got your own summertime. I mean, some, some of you, all of a sudden, it's six, eight degrees in the house, and all of a sudden, you sweating and perspiring. And all of a sudden, you fanning. And, and I, I witnessed it just standing here on Sunday. Last week, I saw a woman sitting right over there just fanning. I'm saying, I'm, I'm taking a I said, what is the temperature? It's 68 degrees. Everybody else is freezing. But she has her own summertime. Jesus can kill the heat. He can cool the flame. My next point is it's right there in the text. Jesus conquers our opposition. Jesus is able to conquer. Jesus conquers our opposition. In the text it says, but Simon Peter's mother-in-law was sick with a high fever. They made request of him. They went to Jesus and they asked Jesus, Jesus, if anybody can fix it, we know you can. Verse 39, so he stood over her and rebuked the fever. And the fever left her. Jesus is able to conquer all of our opposition. Your boss man, Jesus, can conquer the opposition. I know you've been passed over. I, I, I know they refuse to let you do things that you don't want to do for the Lord. But Jesus can conquer your opposition. I know you're the wrong color. I know you've been the wrong places. And they told you to go around back. And I know you, they told you that they don't have any seats and no hotel room. I've gone to a hotel room. The woman says to me, we don't have any hotel room. Then a guy that didn't look like me walks up. Yes, sir. We have three, four of them. Which one would you like to have? I didn't protest. I just know they didn't want me there. I didn't want, I wasn't comfortable enough to sleep there after that anyhow. Y'all go on with your bad self. Have it your way. But I know that God is able to reposition us. And I went right down the street with a hotel that welcomed me. And they told me that I will not charge you an early check-in fee. And by the way, you can stay here for two extra hours when folks check out. We're going to give you favor just because you had the right attitude when you walked in the door. Jesus, Jesus alone, he conquers all our opposition. Jesus is able to put us, put us where we need to be and not where we want to be. I oftentimes tell the story. I'm participating in my master's degree. I got one last class, Hazel, and one last class, and I'm going to graduate. I'm going to have my master's, and I'm going to invite the church, and I had already invited the church. Now, this is Friday afternoon, and graduation is Sunday, two days away. The church knows. My family knows. People are looking for the celebration. I get an email that says, Flump, TH501. <laughs> Flump, TH501. Dr. Amonette has declared that he has flunked me in my last class, the only class I needed to graduate. I saved his class for last so I can concentrate on him because they were bragging about the fact that he's flunked more students than any other uh, professor on campus. So I wanted to go head to head with him, one on one, taking no other class. But when I walked in the room the first day, he looks at me and says, I know you have a prestigious grade point average. Well, I thought it was a compliment, Sister Woods. I thought he was, I mean, I'm just, I'm just back in Mississippi, you know. I thought 
thought the man was complimenting me. He said, I know you have this prestigious a grade point average. I, I just follow up and say, yes, sir, I have a 3.45%. I thought it was a compliment. But as time went on that semester, I realized it wasn't a compliment. What he was saying to me, Sister James, he was really saying to me, I'm going to see how much of it I can break. I'm going to see how much I can pad you down. I'm going to see how I can bring that A average down to a zero if I possibly can. All my book reports were in on time. All of my assignments were in on time. 90 some on every test, hundreds on every test. We get to the final exam. I'm sitting at the computer. I just, God positioned me in the right place at the right time. I'm sitting at the computer. I'm typing. And then he sends me an email saying, fail TA501. I look at the email, and you know, the one thing about it, I don't mind facing my opposition. I drove all the way across town so I can, I can face my opposition. I drove all, I got in the car. I drove all the way across the town, and I wanted to know from him, what do you mean? And when I got there, Brother Irvin, he had left and locked his door. So I went to the dean, and I asked him, what's really going on? He said, just slide your test paper under the door. I said, well, he said he didn't flunk me. He said, just slide your test paper under the door. So we get into this email exchange. Dr. Amonette says to me, he says, look, you should have had that in at 12 noon. I said, well, the time you gave me was 4 o'clock. He said, but when I sent the first test, I sent you the wrong test. And since I sent the wrong one, I sent you the second one. Even though you had started on the wrong one, I sent the second one. And here I am. I'm trying to be 4 p.m. But what he did in the email, he changed the time from 4 o'clock to 12 noon. And he sends me an email at 12 19 telling me I'm wrong. It was that time that, that, that righteous indignation rose up in me. And I said, I need to see Dr. Amonette before the day is over. I'm scared to graduate in two days. I need to see him now. I want to see the little short red man in front of me. He says, just slide, the dean says, just slide the paper under the door. Church didn't know about it. The family didn't know about it. But I had to fight this battle. There's some battles I had just had to fight. So he grades my paper because the dean made him grade my paper, and he sends my paper back. I'm still trying to be polite. I said, Dr. Eminem, uh, I'm just asking for mercy. I didn't see the change time. He said, I'm going to grade your paper. That is your mercy. Mm, God handles. Jesus conquers. He graded my paper. Now, I got a 3.45 average. He grades my paper and sends the paper back with a 38 on the paper. That's what I said. My, 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 along with some other things. <laughs> he gives me a 38 on the paper. And when he averaged out my grade, I still had a C average. But watch out, God. God handles your opposition. Jesus places you in places so you can be a testimony to others. I didn't cry about it. I didn't beat him up about it even though I want, I slept all night long and got up the next day wanting to choke him on the spot. But he graded my paper, gave me a 38, and then when graduation day came, they assigned him to march the graduates in. And because my last name starts with a D, I was the first person he had to look at. And they forced him to walk straight down the aisle and look at me. And bad, you better believe I gave him eye contact. All the way there with my flopping robe on, with my, my cap sitting with my tassel on the right side. I eyeballed him all the way for the hop. I looked at him all the way down that aisle. And then when he got to me, he took a turn. And then I was the first one to follow him in. It was killing him. But then to top it all off, we had done some community service and they chose me for the missionary award of the year. It was killing me. And then when I got, got my diploma, the dean that told me, that made him grade my paper, the dean said, I want you to walk around here and shake every professor's hand. And the first one I had to shake was Dr. Eminem. Got my diploma, we went outside, everybody, the first and ever see I've ever received in my master's, and I walk outside, and there's Dr. Eminette. I said, honey, baby, take this picture. Dr. Eminette, come on here, let's take the picture. I took the picture with Dr. Eminette. I savor that picture. 
I keep that picture. I, I look at that picture to remind me that Jesus is able to conquer all of our oppositions. Young people, you don't have to cuss them out. You don't have to fuss it out. You don't have to stand on top of the dead. Watch what God will do in the midst of your opposition. Jesus conquers all our opposition. In the text, you find this woman. This woman has the opposition of a high fever. This woman has, has been at the point where she's facing death. But when Jesus shows up, he shuts it down. The next point, Jesus controls our results. I know false prophets have told you that you're going to be blessed, and you are blessed and highly favored. And I'm looking at them and saying, my name ain't Mary. Jesus was about to be born. His mama Mary was impregnated by the Holy Spirit. And they, they, when the angel approached her, he said, you are blessed and highly favored. New beginning members, please be theologically correct. That's the only place that Jesus was because Jesus was on the scene. It's the only place that the Bible can describe somebody as blessed and highly favored. Let me tell you, don't be so holy until you just inject theology where he, he, you think it ought to be because God has a way of blessing Mary because you ain't carrying no baby. If you mess around and carry a baby, it better be by a man. Mm. Yeah, so, so when you have opposition, God is able to bless you and understand that Jesus controls the results. Don't let any prophet tell you by any morning you're going to have this, that, and that. I told, you, I told you in Bible study, the fact is that if you are a prophet, I don't need to tell you everything. You know, do you have children? You ought to know if I got children or not. Are your children strung out on drugs? No, tell me something else. What we have to do is stop filling up coliseums, going to folk that's walking the floor like never before, that going to folk that, that proclaim to be in touch with God when they're way out of touch with God. Just walk with God. Just show up on Sunday and get a fundamental Bible teaching so you don't have to look for mystical stuff. Jesus controls the results. Man can't promise us anything. We can see in our political reader, they can promise stuff they can't deliver. They always overpromise. And the fact of the matter is, the man at the top doesn't really make a decision when you have a Congress that votes it in and votes it out. Look to Jesus to control the atmosphere. Look to Jesus for the result because Jesus is the only one who can give us absolute results right now. We got, we got to make sure we get to a point where we understand, like this woman who had a fever, the people understood that Jesus handled the results. Jesus controlled the results. Jesus made the result happen when Jesus wanted to happen. Don't get so pressured because it has not happened, because some false prophet lied to you. Just make sure you keep your hand in the master's hand. Jesus is able to control the result. And regardless of what you do, you do what God tells you to do. You do what the doctor says do and watch what Jesus does. Jesus will amaze the doctor. We got all these people on our prayer list and my prayer is God blow the doctors away. God amaze the doctor. God, God make the doctor question his teaching. God make the doctor question his or her learning. God amaze the doctors. Jesus handles. Jesus controls. Jesus initiates our results. Don't look to man for results because men will let you down. Men will shoot you down. Men will shout you down. You know, you know, you can tell when a person that's your friend that's not satisfied and not happy with what you're doing. When you get blessed and they say, well, girl, everybody ain't able. That ain't a compliment. Well, girl, you know, everybody ain't able, you know. Well, they're not complimenting you. What they're saying is I'm hating on you. I am so upset because you got blessed before God blessed me. Let me just tell you, as a Christian, what you need to do. As a Christian, you need to make sure that when somebody else gets blessed, you rejoice along with them. You celebrate with them. You be glad for them. Simply because if God is blessing somebody in the neighborhood, you know that he's in the neighborhood. And it's a matter of time before he come around the corner. 
get right with God. That's why when we serve communion, we say, hey, look now, look, don't, don't play with God. Just forgive him. I know he did you wrong. Just forgive her. I know she intentionally did you wrong. But get yourself right with God so Jesus can control the result. Paul says some have drank and some have eaten and they have eaten and drinken themselves into damnation and some of them have drank and eat them, eaten themselves to death. Trust Jesus to control the result. My next point I see right here in the text, this woman, this woman had a fever. The fever wouldn't break. The doctor couldn't cure it. Jesus confirmed his deity. Jesus confirms his deity. No one controls, no one confirms that Jesus is a divine like God does. Jesus confirms that he is God. John says in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and in the beginning he was with, there with God. Verse 14 says, and in the beginning, Jesus that was with God, this Word that was with God, this Word that is God, verse 14 says, and the Word became flesh and dwelled among them. Jesus Christ walked among them. God showed up on earth through Jesus Christ. He is the visible image of the invisible God. He shows up on, on the stage where we are sinners and on our way to hell. He shows up, but his deity is present. He is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Jesus is deity. How do he show, he show that Jesus is deity? Because the Bible says he stood over her. And he rebuked the fever. In your prayer life, in your prayer life, don't concern yourself all the time with talking to the devil. Be more concerned about talking to God. Because the devil is powerful. But God is all powerful. God, the devil is, he's, he got little imps that go places. But God is all present. Jesus has a way of blessing us even in the presence of the devil. The psalmist said it this way he said, put your, put your own, your long flowing gown. He says, the psalmist says in Psalm 1, that he will prepare a table in the presence of your enemies. He will make your enemies your footstool, so you might as well get dressed for the party. God is throwing a banquet. God is throwing a party right in the middle of your enemies talking about you, right in the middle of your enemies hard down pressed on you. God is able to make your enemies your footstool. You don't have to be sassy about it, but just square your shoulders. Hold up your head and walk like they taught you to walk and step like you're headed somewhere. I told you, when I, when I got here, I was here, a month, uh, I was here a year and a half. Uh, my closest family was 600 miles away. I had determined that I was not going. I was not going to go back to Mississippi. I got a little apartment. I used a flashlight for my light. I would run in, turn the flashlight on, jump in the shower, turn the flashlight off so I could save my battery. I made sure I had a place to stay. I paid my bill, my rent on time. I was waiting on the light bill money. Maybe you never had to wait on the light bill money. Maybe you've never been where I've been. I had more month than money. And, and let me tell you, even though I had more money than money, I showed up clean and smelling good to work every day. And when I was looking for a job, I got dressed up in one of my three suits I owned. And I was dressed to the hilt, and I was walking downtown uh, Houston, Texas, going from one place to the other. And when I walked in the city of Houston, they said, why are you all dressed up? I said, so you can remember how I was dressed, and you can choose my resume. The problem with young folk today, they think they can wear anything, do anything, and young women think all sizes fit all. You'll get that by the time you get to the house. Oh, they just saying that, and now they come to the conclusion that 
All sizes kind of fit all. All sizes usually fit all. Let me tell you, don't believe the story. All sizes don't fit all, and if you can't breathe in it, it's too tight. Jesus concerns himself. He confirms his deity, and he confirmed his deity even during the midst of the storm. When the storm was headed one way and we were relaxed and the, the news reporter just kept saying, don't get relaxed. Don't take it for granted. But 99.9% .9 of us got relaxed and took it for granted and all of a sudden the lies alone at the gas station. There is no food on the shelf. Let me just ask y'all a question. You can talk back to me if you can. Why people don't have food in the middle of emergencies when they have food all year long? Why do I have to get in a long line at the last minute? We know hurricane is season coming in June every year. Why do I have to wait to stock up? I got to wait to hear the man says, the man, the, 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 the meteorologist say, I got to wait to hear the meteorologist say, well, you better stock up. No, I ain't stocking up. I ain't going down that long line. I'll wait till the line die down. I ain't going down there fighting. You can run out of gas sitting in the gas line trying to get some gas. But we are not prepared. Jesus confirms his deity in that we got so relaxed and all of a sudden the storm turned toward evil. And then we got this big panic. Folk getting upset with their boss because they can't go home and get off. People all upset. God does what God wants to do. When God wants to do it. Any way God wants to do it, with whom he wants to do it, any time he wants to do it. The God we serve is a sovereign God, and because he is sovereign, he doesn't tell us everything he's doing before we do it. He's God. Jesus confirms his deity. My next point, Jesus causes us to serve. Jesus causes us so look at, look at verse 39. Verse 39 says, So he stood over her and rebuked the fever. He shut it down. The fever retreated, left her. And immediately she arose and served him. Let me tell you, when you've gone through some things, people are telling you it doesn't take all that, that just confirms they haven't gone through anything. Because when you go through some things, People saying, preacher, you ain't got to raise your voice like that. Let me tell you, I'm the watchman on the wall, and I'm telling you, you better be warned. You better stay, stay faithful. You better make sure that you do the right thing now because Jesus is coming back again. Somebody tell you, going out of that church, man, you can enjoy church online. But Hebrews chapter 10 says, you, did, you ought not forsake the assembly of yourselves together. We ought to come together in fellowship together. We ought to come together and iron sharpens iron. We ought to sharpen each other. And we wonder why we back in person when we got, got stuff going on uh, that we can see everything all over the world. During COVID, some folk will watch six different churches, but they gave to none. I think i said say that again. Folk watch six different churches but financially gave to none. And some people got an excuse why they didn't give during COVID. Don't you know your church goes through some stuff? We, we, you would not imagine the amount of money we spend just on AC. And it's like every summer, every summer is something. Every summer is something new. And it waits right good to June and July here. So I'm praying, Lord, don't let the devil, don't let the kinker worms eat up what you have given to us so we can continue to give to you. God is able, God is able to control the result, and God is able to put us in a position to serve. I'm telling you, when, you, when, you, when you've been through something, you look to see where God is at work. When you've gone through some things, you look to see where God can use you. When you have not been able, I got several calls. I have several calls. When we were out for COVID, we got to get in, get back to church. I'm, I'm about to go still crazy looking at these walls. I, I, I'm, I'm tired of walking the neighborhood two, three times a day. We got to get back in church. And then when we open the church, one woman says to me, when 
this is after a funeral. You know, people get so, so emotional at a funeral. I have administered so many funerals of folk I hadn't seen in years and family members that just don't show up. But at the funeral, I'm kind, I'm loving, I'm trying to comfort them through. One woman said, my, my niece and I, we're going to be back in that church as soon as the doors is open. Now, this is, this is, this is August. We, as soon as you open the church back up, we're going to be there every Sunday. I said, baby, we've been back in the church since August of last year. <laughs> you, you done missed nine to 12 months already. And guess what? Still, how long, how long since 2020 is for four years, they still hadn't shown up. We have to understand that when you go through something, God is positioning you to serve him the better. The Bible says this woman, fever, left her, and as soon as her fever left her, she arose and immediately began to work for the Lord. Let me tell you, too many people sitting on their lawn, too many people sitting on their hands, too many people watching other folk do, it's too many people that saying, it's not my job. Don't walk past paper, pick it up. Don't walk past children being abused, say something. Don't walk past things that need to be done. Don't let your community die, die down. Make sure you work and serve. Let Make sure you become a missionary for the Lord. You, you got to do something. You got you to do something. I challenge you today to ask the Lord, Lord, what more can I do to serve you? What more can I do to serve my church? Lord, what more can I do to serve my community? When Hurricane Harvey hit, we had to take in some people. And, and when we got electricity, I went in there and knocked on doors. Told my daughter, y'all got to get up out of here. We going down to the city hall. There are still people who don't have ice. They don't have water. There are still people who are without. And God has just blessed us to come out of this in three days. Y'all got to get up out of here because we're going down to City Hall and we're going to pack some bags and we're going to throw some ice and we're going to put some water in the back of cars. Because when you've been through something, you ought to know how other folk feel. When you've gone through something, you ought to get up and serve other people. And when you serve other people, you ought to give a great gratitude of service unto them. It, it ought to make you happy. To serve. It ought to make, if everybody in this room have electricity, you need to look for your neighbor who doesn't have any. You need to invite them to freeze their stuff for them. You, you need to invite them to come over and get a cold drink of water. You need to make sure that you check on them back and forth and make sure that they are doing good. Don't you just lay up in the air condition and don't provide service for somebody else. I challenge you today, ask God, God, where are you working? God, what are you doing? God, what more can I do? And then obey the voice of God. My final point, and I'll leave you alone. Jesus completes his assignment. Jesus sets it straight. Jesus completes his assignment. How we tell our children, how often do we tell our children, finish what you started? The reason why people hire people with degrees is not because the degree has made them better than anybody else. Hazelin is just they completed what they started. What that says to the employer is that you're going to start something on my job, and I can depend on you to complete what you started. You, you having trouble in your marriage, com complete what you started. You having trouble on your job, complete what you started. I sit on, I sit on the job, they, I, I was in the chemical plant for 30 years doing my thing, and then I hit 50, and they told me I had to go inside. Put a 22-year-old in my place. Now I gotta sit inside and look at a computer. And I've been doing this for 30 years and I know it like the back of my hand. And the 22 year old said, I ain't never seen the inside of a chemical plant before in my life. And then he says, I get sick and tired of walking through the plant and everybody asks me, where's Matt Davis, where's Matt Davis? I'm about to tear this FlowServe tag off so they won't know I'm representing FlowServe. But because I was angry, because I was so upset, because they had done me wrong, they didn't want the old man in the plant anymore. 
But just because, young people, they had done me wrong, I had to sit at the computer and I had to make sure that I engineered from the computer instead of in the field. What I had to do is sit there and make sure that those in the field looked good. And as I made them look good, I'm preparing all the time my resume. I'm, I'm looking for another job, but I got a good attitude, a smile on my face. I'm not holding a chip against anybody else. I am going to walk in there and give it my best. And as I gave it my best, they began to allow me to do whatever I want to do. Go and come. I told my supervisor, look, man, I got an interview today. I need to be off. They allowed me to do whatever I wanted to do. Then when I gave my letter of resignation, I pushed it to him. He pushed it back to me because I kept my head and my hand in the right place. And when you keep your head and your hand in the right place, they were amazed that I was able to accomplish things, even in my distress, that no one else was able to accomplish. He wouldn't even accept my letter of resignation. I said, but I got to go now. Uh, what you want to do, you want to move from one relationship to the other on your own terms. You don't, you don't want them to put you out. You don't want them to fight over you. You don't, you don't want them to, to do regulations just to fit you. You want to be able to serve and complete your assignment. Some of you are on assignment today. And while you're on your assignment, ask God, God, how do I complete my assignment? We have too many quitters. We have too many people giving up. I say to you, don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Don't give out. Don't give in. Keep your hand to the plow. The Bible teaches that if a man, a woman, boy, or girl put their hand to the plow and they turn back, they're not fit for the kingdom. Stay with the Lord. Let him use you. Let him use you to serve other people. And when he uses you to serve others, you ought to get a great sense of accomplishment because you are serving God. Don't retire. The people who are retiring, you ought not retire on God. When people retire, this is what they say. I'm going to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, the way I want to do it, anytime time I want to do it. I'm going to just sit down and do whatever I want to do. If I don't want to move that morning, I ain't going to move. But an object at rest will remain at rest until it moves. An object in motion will remain in motion until it's acted upon by an equal or greater outside force. You got to move. You got to do something. You got to make sure that God is utilizing you. This present day suffering is not to be compared to the glory that is yet to be revealed to you in Christ Jesus. This is just a short period of time. Matter of fact, it's a very short period of time. You live 120 years. It's still a short period of time compared to eternity. Over yonder, we're going to rejoice. Over yonder, we're going to be rewarded. Over yonder, God is going to bless us. Jesus made sure that it happened over 2,000 years ago. Jesus of Christ, I tell you, he died on Calvary. Mean men killed him. Mean men whipped him. Mean men hung him high. Mean men dropped him low. Mean men killed, pierced him in his side. He died, I tell you, on Calvary. They took him off the cross. He going to finish his course. He's going to finish his assignment. They laid him in a barber tomb. It was a barber tomb because it didn't need it that long. It was a barber tomb because early that third day morning, he got up with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. The Holy Ghost raised up a dead Jesus. And as he has raised up a dead Jesus, he can raise up you today. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. Jesus handles the heat. Regardless of what you're going through, regardless of how hot it may get, Jesus can handle the heat. He can handle our attitude. He can handle our opposition. He cures us of our sicknesses. Even without any side effects. Jesus conquers our opposition. The Jesus we serve is able to bless us. He handles the heat. We ought to be praying. We ought to be praying for others. Lord, Give them cool. Bless their atmosphere. Get their lights back on. And Lord, while you're in the process, I'm going to volunteer ice. I'm going to volunteer water. I'm going to check on them. I'm going to invite them over to my house. And don't use the excuse, my house is too junky. You should have cleaned it up before the storm. 
Everything's out of place. You should have had it in place before the storm. 11, 12, 13 people ought to be in your house if your neighbors, we use the excuse, you know you can't invite everybody in your house, guys. And you're right. That's why you got to stay with God and let God fix it. And let God speak. Jesus finishes his assignment. You on planet Earth to finish your assignment. Ask Jesus, Lord, what should I be doing? Lord, I know you didn't put me on Earth to eat and sleep, work, make money. There's a greater calling on your life. Jesus is causing us to serve. The door is open. There may be some who don't have a church home. I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the captain of the ship. If you're here today and you've never received Jesus as your personal savior, this is your moment if you would, just bow your head with me and invite him in. If you're going to go to heaven when you die, you need Jesus. If you're going to be saved, you need Jesus. Just bow your head and repeat this simple prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. Now come into my life and make me a new person. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now rise in my life. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe if you honestly pray this prayer, trust him in the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, that you're now saved, you're born again, and you're on your way to heaven. Oh, we thank God for who he is and what he has already done. We serve the awesome and the amazing. We serve the awesome and the amazing God. It is offering time. It is offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. If you want an envelope or need an envelope, please raise your hand and you will be served. Please raise your hand way up in the air and you will be served. If you want to give electronically, you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting. Dot Jesus at yahoo.com is our Zelle account. You want to mail in your gift, you can do so by mailing to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas 77459. Thank God for another privilege to give unto him. Thank God for a privilege of giving to him. Amen. Father God, we thank you, Father God, for blessing us with money, with income, with increase. We thank you, Father God, for blessing us with all that you've given us. Now, Lord, we come to you to give back to you. We ask you to bless every giver and every giver. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank God.
decide to stand. Follow first impressions on the rear to the front. Bring forth the Lord's tithes, offering, and sacrifice here. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We bless your name. God, we know you as the great the healer, the great comforter, the one who keeps us, heals us, and blesses us. We thank you, Lord, that you are the curer. You're the great physician. We come lifting those before you, Father God, that are discouraged. We pray, Father God, that you bless them. Lord, we lift those, Father God, who are sick. We, Lord, and we ask you to amaze the doctor. Blow the minds of the doctors in such a way, Father God, that they will know that you are God and you're the only true and living God. 
We pray that you continue to visit those, Father God, who's been waiting on you to move. Encourage them, Father God, to trust you, continue to trust you. Bless them, Father God, that they don't get weary and well-doing. We pray for those who have been convicted of service. We ask you to bless them now. Lord, we pray for the summer enrichment camp. We pray for those who will prepare, those who have prepared, those who will teach, those who will participate. We pray for every parent. Now, Lord, we lift up those who are without light. We pray, Father God, that the grid will come back on soon. We pray, Father God, that they will have electricity and air conditioning. We pray, Father God, that you will give them every drink of water that they need. We pray that you will provide food, clothing, and shelter. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to bless those who cannot afford the basics of life. Lord, we ask you to keep them. Now bless us to become missionaries that will reach out to those who are less fortunate than we are. Bless their lives, Father God, as we become blessings to them. Lord, we thank you for the New Beginning Church. We ask you to bless us to continue to be a beacon light to darken this world. Lord, we thank you for the victory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank you. We have visitors. We ask our visitors to stand if you're visiting with us, especially those who are visiting for the first time when you stand. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Will you tell us who, 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 what your name is and who invited you, or you just saw a church on the side of the road? No. <laughs> uh, my name is Sandra Bird, and I am a minister with the Dirty Deacon. And I am not dealing with you, so I like your name, Sandra, because I sacrificially come to church. You sacrificially come to church. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sister Charlene Lewis, thank you so much for being with us. She says she's cycling with us. She's cycling in front of us. She, she is the cyclist. Every Thursday I say, now don't, don't run off and leave me now. So she is, she's a heavy cyclist, so we are glad to have you with us. And we know there were many choices you had, and we thank you for coming to be a part of our service. We have some of our missionaries here from, from Mississippi. My sister Jane to introduce our, our missionaries who are here. Thank you so much for being here. Well, glorify your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, praise him. Praise him. Praise him. And, and while we're on that subject, those of you who supported our mission trip, as you can see, our thermometer is right near the top. I don't know who put it there. I don't know if it's true. But we're very close to $40,000. So thank you so much for your donation. And uh, our children had an opportunity to go to two civil rights museums, B.B. King Museum, as well as the National Civil Rights Museum. They were able to perform at six different locations. We were able to perform for senior citizens housing complex. We were able to pack bags for senior citizens that are less fortunate than we are. Our children had a great time and they got to see missions at work. I warned them, as you know, I warned them several times, this is not a vacation. So they were up at six every morning and we were back at, at 10, 
o'clock at night, and we did that for a whole five-day period, and they, they were they were awesome, and they know what missions is what it's all about. So next trip, we, we take, we will be uh, joining with Brown Baptist for a domestic mission trip, and then we will be joining a, a Turning Hearts group to go on a foreign mission trip, and some of you need to be a part of that. See some things you've never seen before, and you can come back more appreciative of where you are and what God has done. Amen. Amen. All minds clear. Sister David, you want to come and say something about the the camp and also look to see you at five o'clock today. Men, we really, really need you. We really, really need you to be a part of today. We need everybody at the church to come back and we want the men to carry the heavy load. The thing I have to say is just pray. Just pray. And let God work. Thank you so much. The only thing she said is pray. I said pray and show up and, and participate. Why don't we stand? Jesus handles the heat. Jesus takes the heat off of us. Jesus is able to bless us. Jesus controls the atmosphere. Jesus gives us the results. Thank you, God, that Jesus is able to keep our opposition away. Lord, we ask you to bless us now as we go down from this place. Bless us, Father God, that we will remember what Jesus has done for us. And bless us to continue to be a beacon light in a dark and dismal world. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him, the only Son of God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. Our mission and vision, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 33. You are dismissed.